Thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks for uh, coming, coming after lunch. Um, so, you know, I'm gonna, we have a quick uh, 15 minutes here. Um, I'm not gonna read everything on the slides. I think we sort of present them to there. Um, kind of in the fall, the people saw the panel this morning where we talked a little bit about enterprise blockchain, hybrid blockchain, et cetera. Um, there are blockchain use cases everywhere, right? Um, and there's a good tie out, right? Sometimes they try to step up. Well, my, my goal here is to sort of bring you to a picture where there is a tie out between, you know, some things that are happening on private blockchains may not involve tokens, how that could integrate within and bring tokens there, and why there may be a spot for permission blockchains per se for some classes of tokens, or at least some level of permissioning. Um, obviously, we know the main ones, right? Banking, lots of stuff in financial markets. Uh, Retail is an interesting token use case, people looking at loyalty points. Uh, probably not something that you want traded, right, outside, right? They're going to maintain the value, they're an accounting asset essentially, but I might want to have an ecosystem where I can actually have loyalty points and loyalty rewards that can be spent across multiple providers, for example. But I probably don't want to go trade those and mark up their value because uh, they actually have a back-end accounting value on some public chain or public exchange, right? So maybe a, a use case there for some type of more permissioned, limited uh, chain. Supply chain, we've talked, you probably heard a lot about you know, towards this morning. Um, at the end, I'll wrap up with how supply chain ties into uh, potential tokens. Healthcare, we've got some interesting cases, both from an identity perspective, tokenization of records, uh, things like medical claims, claims processing. Again, there's always gonna be things where people might wanna have tokens for settlement, for what it may be, but those are not necessarily going to be your typical stores of values or currencies and you're probably not gonna put those out into an unknown world, right, where anybody can have access to them. Uh, we've got manufacturing, uh, things like governance policies, et cetera, and also tied to financial services, clearly, you know, insurance, right, which actually behind the scenes insurance is a lot of finance. So, um, yeah, I, I think IBM, uh, so my, my one IBM blurb in here, this is I am from IBM, um, you know, we, we originally started thinking about blockchain and blockchain for enterprise. I think our, and stay away from potentially tokens and even cryptocurrencies. Uh, that was like two and a half years ago when we kind of started down this journey. Our thinking has probably evolved since then. Um, we're now looking at kind of many things and many classes where, where, where tokens and tokenization actually comes in. Uh, clearly in any world of sort of what I'll call permission, well, I should take a stare of hands up and I won't finish the question. Um, who here believes they know the difference between a permissioned and a permissionless blockchain? It's a good smattering that's out there. Um, just, a, just real quick, maybe I, maybe I should define that real quick. Um, the more traditional definition of permission versus permissionless within this private versus public. A permission blockchain, you have to know all the people who, you have to at least know of and know who, the, who are all the people who validate transactions on the network. In a permissionless blockchain, this is not the case, right? And a node can be spun up anywhere. Bitcoin, Ethereum, mainnet are permissionless networks. Uh, actually, Stellar is a Stellar, as an example, is a permission network in a sense. Every node actually has an identity and can be identified and you know who it actually is. I'm gonna throw another caveat in there and make up my own definition. Maybe it's the IBM definition, but I'm here, so. Um, there's also the permissioning on the blockchain. Right, so we talked about you have to know the nodes, but now let's think about you have to actually know who's transacting on the blockchain. So being able to have actual understanding of the identity, permissioning of those identities and those types of rules. So if you kind of combine those two, that's kind of what I mean by permission blockchains. Digital identity plays a big part in that. Right, you're gonna see identity tokens, uh, you may see identity blockchains, uh, you may see both. How many here have heard of like stable coins? Everybody, right? So there are stable coins, there is going to be digital fiat. Right? We're very interested from perspective on the, on the IBM side, especially if we start looking at use cases. So we do supply chain use cases, right? Which basically track the movement of goods. But right now the payment for those goods, and we can even do trade finance use cases tied to those, which more or less track the IOUs uh, across that. But what if we want to actually track the exchange and or make payments and do finality of settlement on that? Right? We, we need to have, we can't be doing that type of stuff with some currency or, or some, some type of currency, cryptocurrency, that doesn't have a very stable price, right? That's just not the way the world works, right? I'm, I'm taking too much risk, right? When I, when I finance something in trade finance, 
right? I'm financing based on the fact that you're going to deliver what you did and there's a payback on that. I can't have either side of that value fluctuate you know, massively across that period of time. So looking at how do we start getting involved with digital fiat, uh, the issuance of that, and, and stable coins. Um, asset tokenization, great buzzword, right? Um, you know, how do I take any type of asset? I mean, in theory, you can take any type of asset and, and tokenize it, represent it as a token. Uh, but really looking at more like not your non-traditional uh, store of value assets, but how do we deal with private equity? How do we deal with stock shares? Um, how do you deal with energy credits? Uh, how do you deal with tickets? We have a project going on with carbon credits, for example. Right? Those are all kind of assets that exist out there. They have some type of financial value. How do we actually tokenize that and manage that life cycle? Um, the reason why I kind of bring those cases up is I don't think that in the world we live in today, and you'll see the next few charts, uh, where regulation, uh, you know, fluctuation, stabilization are kind of required, that we can truly ever have all of these things just on a completely uh, permissionless world. All right? We have to either know the identity, we have to know where those things are, and maybe you want to know where the issuers of those are. So those kind of primary use cases really lead us to, to more look at how do we combine uh, some of the world, some of the best practices of permission blockchains and permissionless blockchains. The other things that we kind of look at, um, those are the use cases technology-wise, security and design, right? Um, <laughs> I, I get it, you know, I know Bitcoin hasn't been hacked, I know Ethereum you know, hasn't, other than the DAO and programming flaws. Um, but if you're going to start building a system, right, a system of trust and entities, there are a lot of rules and things like that that are out there in the, in the, in the regulated world. And these are good. I mean, I know there's people who believe in full decentralization, but there are things that protect the public good. Um, and, and so we are looking at how do we have that full design. And then the last, the last two are really new business models. Uh, somebody asked a question this morning, right? What are the business models around this, right? Because sometimes maybe you ask yourself, if I can, if I can do it with a centralized system, is there a value of me doing it with a blockchain system, with, with blockchain? And the answer is possibly, right? So how do we affect that business model? And usually the business model is affected by not just stuck as a starting point, right? And then if I, you start to use a blockchain to change my B2B network for supply, and now if I can, can tie in trade finance, integration to other networks, that becomes sort of pretty powerful, right? So it's kind of that full spectrum of use cases rather than just taking on a singular use case that's probably gonna show you uh, your different economic model or your value. And, and governance is the other the other thing, right? So um, you've got the typical the typical models that we mainly focus on from our perspective are probably consortium led, right? These are models, right, where you have a group of people, whether it's a B2B or supply chain network, or uh, we have work that goes on with say CLS Bank, right, which is already a consortium of banks. Uh, they get together, they set the governance rules, right? As opposed to a rule, the thing that's just purely open source. There's no kind of known set of parties that are doing it. There's any party, you know, as part of that, and the sort of code is law. So those are the kind of key areas that, 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 that we think, um, you know, really start to bring these things together. I love this chart. Uh, somebody created it. Uh, I used to be like a physics guy way back when, and so it's pretty interesting. But if you just look at this, right, <laughs> thank God you don't have to recite it, right? Remember the days of memorizing the periodic table? Um, it's kind of like now when we add all those new elements that are past like 100 that, you know, that none of us know. There's like a new one every day, right? And while this is great, don't get me wrong, it's great to show the innovation, et cetera. Uh, and I borrowed this chart, you can see that, you can see that there. Um, what do you know about any of these coins? How much do people really know? Right? If I'm going to bring this to the mainstream, if we're going to introduce this into business, if business is where to start, do you want to use one of these as the underlying value or the store of value to transfer something? How can they have any faith or trust in most of these, right? They're unknown, they're issued by unknown quantities, some of them are ICOs, some of them are true cryptocurrencies that were stores of value. Some of them are just made up, right? Uh, I mean, if you know, it's a small thing, if you search hard enough, you can actually find like at least 15 coins out there made by me that are worth nothing, but they're out there. Uh, and, and, and they're actually listed because they're ERC20 tokens and you can find them. Um, please buy them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, it was just those were the sort of experiments. So now if you look at the current model, there's no liability, right, in the current model. So imagine if you're a person and, and you have this, your money's in there and we're using cryptocurrency and I have my private key and my nice wallet and I keep it myself. 
or somewhere else. And now I lose it. And now those funds are locked up forever. In theory, bro, practicality, right? That's the way the blockchain actually works. That's not the way the world works, right? And if you're gonna take this to the masses, right, and have that sort of regulation and trust, right, and make this thing into currencies and assets that people can use in the mainstream and trust, right, you're gonna have to start looking at maybe not an extreme model to the right, but more of a model that does have some level of governance frameworks, some level of protections for people. Now, you can still be cryptographically secure, you can still have some level of dis distribution, maybe not full decentralization, but if you really do want these to be used, used in cases where we, we do this and you have legal contractual binding things, at least in the near future, right, we have to know about the entities that, that are running this, right? Um, as a small thing, right, I often look at, there was a survey done in the US, uh, they asked a bunch of people, I forgot the sampling of people, they said if you were to, you know, get a $400 expense this month, an extra $400 expense, could you handle it? They said no, right? So if we want to facilitate and make these stuff useful for business and for people, right, we have to have a way to have protections. Um, and, and we can't do that when there's zero liability in the entire thing. I'm sorry, I know the code can rule, but I think you can't do it without, the, without some level of liability and some level of knowingness. <coughs> Not all tokens are created equal. This is the summation of what I just said there, right? We have cryptocurrencies, they have a purpose, right? You have Bitcoin, Ethereum, Zcash, Right, which derive their value, they, they, they're great in there. You have things from permission blockchains, or sort of pseudo crypto like Stellar that's out there. We've got a ton of coins that were done as initial coin, initial coin offerings. Some good, some possibly bad. Um, we just saw two recent court cases, right, filed, one in New York and whatever, where they literally said you were a security, uh, you ripped people off, we're fining you, right? Uh, we have people doing utility tokens. Right, which may have some, if you pay this thing, I may be able to use this token to, you know, for purchase something in the future, play a game, et cetera. STOs and ETOs are the more, the most interesting thing coming out today, right? Security tokens and equity tokens, right? So if I take, you know, my more of my assets and I securitize any asset, give it value, it's backed by some, by some type of thing, um, that's gonna be pretty powerful. They are gonna be regulated. We can do Reg D, Reg A, Reg A plus, et cetera, but they all have rules. Right, a right, deed contract, you know, 99 US investors, I have to know who the investors are, uh, credit investors, I have to be able to maintain stuff outside. So I have to be able to identify users, I have to maintain where this stuff is held, I have to have rules about how I advertise this. All these things, you know, lead to you, you have to have some notion of identity, permission, trust within the whole thing, right? Not just out there. And then we mentioned uh, digital fiat as well, loyalty rewards, etc. Uh, digital identity tokens are also pretty interesting, uh, right? Where I can actually start to, so you still want to have some level of anonymity, at least to the consumer of the actual token, but maybe I need to have some level of, you know, I, we trust a set of issuers or uh, testers uh, to, to these types of identity attributes. Um, so those are the sort of differences there. Uh, I covered all this here, um, but primarily, right, looking at, if you look at all the rules for regulation, compliance, security, KYC, AML, most of these are actually going to require that you have to know the participants in the transactions and probably the people who are holding and managing the, managing the assets themselves. Uh, just a couple of quick use cases here. Um, privacy is another big concern. Um, and things like G privacy and GDPR, right? And GDPR, for example, if you guys are familiar with GDPR from the Europe stuff here, European side, <laughs> if anybody's had to implement it, it's great for Europeans, terrible from an implementer perspective, right? If your data is leaked, goes outside the domain of the EU, and you're responsible for it, uh, your company is massively fined. Now I'm not talking a small fine, we're talking massive fines, right? So that means that I have to know that the nodes that reside, where the data is, that they all reside in the EU, I have to know who they are, before I'm even gonna be willing to transact on a network, right? Those are the types of rules that we have in terms of privacy that have to be enforced, which again brings me back to sort of permission. Uh, lastly, um, tying in just other use cases in here. Uh, if I have to know who everybody is, and all networks need to know who people are, <laughs> maybe we can start to look at sort of shared KYC, know your customer platforms, right? Where we don't have to have actually each individual person go and attest to your identity, but I can actually have a platform where we start to share that value because we want to have the overall ecosystem of, of, of networks and currencies, et cetera, able to accept the same types of identities. So this is a case of bringing a permission blockchain off to the side. 
lastly, I have like seven seconds, I'm gonna go over by like two minutes. Um, when you look at what we're really looking at in terms of the overall stuff, the foundation of economic activity is really the exchange of goods and services. Um, and as, as I mentioned, right, one of the big things is I can exchange, I can trade you a car, right, I can have a contract that says I'm gonna give you $10,000 for the car, right, and we can do that on a blockchain today. And maybe we do that on a permission blockchain because we only care about the car dealers. But how do I actually get you the $10,000? Right, uh, and if that ten thousand dollars should be ten thousand U.S., etc., maybe we're going to have to go use. So we can do on hyperledger fabric, for example, the management of the cars and the permission side. Right, then we're going to need some network to settle this stuff out. We can pick to use Stellar. We can pick to use Ethereum. Right, uh, we can pick Bitcoin. We IBM just we don't happen to work with Bitcoin, so I didn't put it on here. But there's nothing that says you couldn't do that. Lastly, you need some level of identity that's shared across there. Sovereign. The sovereign stuff, the indie software, provides a great way of having private identities, right? So we start to see this whole mix of permission ledgers on the hyperledger fabric side or other examples, Stellar side there, uh, permissionless networks on the Ethereum side, tying them all together because that's where the actual money and store of value actually may reside. We need to have some level of identity, you know, off to the side. Lastly, you can say this is all great. I'm really going over. Um, this is all great, except how would you even know what's out there? Right, so we have the cryptocurrency stuff. It's pretty hard for you to know what they all are. So the last thing that we've sort of been working on um, with a partner of ours, uh, this is from IBM, but my buddy was gonna speak with me, uh, Jonathan uh, Levy from Acera. We said, hey, we wanna to bring together all these networks. What are these tokens? What are the rules? What are the permissions? Maybe there's a shared identity across all of them. But today we actually have no place where you could actually go to find all of these. You can scout the internet. You can read, you know, CoinDesk and, and announcements there. Uh, so we actually uh, ourselves, Oracle, Microsoft uh, have all partnered with uh, with Jonathan's company uh, with, on the Unbounded Registry, and this is basically a registry that will list out what are all the networks that are out there, what kind of assets are available on them. Uh, what do you actually do on that? How do you join or participate in those either from a node or, or from an end user perspective? Uh, what kind of tokens are there out there? And the final piece of resistance there will be to actually look at how do we start to issue identities, uh, decent, you know, decentralized identifiers that can be trusted across that everybody who's a participant in this whole registry world can actually start to accept, right? So now bringing it back together, we have a world that says, okay, I can know who the end users are potentially, or at least know what they were attested to. I can know in permission networks, I can have some cases where I have to know who the nodes are. We can have networks that run those. We can run transactions with, on, on public networks if we need to, right, for settlement and finality. Uh, we can have some, some networks that don't need to be public, so we can put the public and the, the transaction of the cars and their coins can all be private. We can mix all of these together, <laughs> start to meet the regulations, basically build, you know, fit for purpose solutions based on the regulation, the needs, and the demands. But if we can really start to orchestrate this network of networks, that's where the real power is, and that's what I see that will actually be able to grow the entire blockchain economy. I went three minutes over, so I gotta stop. Thank you very much.